Um, well, for those of you who don't know me, I am Brad Sarian. Um, I'm a pastor. They, they all make fun of me. I, we are Restored LA. We're in the San Fernando Valley. We're in Northridge. Some people don't think that's actually Los Angeles, but it is, so they make fun of us that we're Restored LA. But anyways, um, we are close, close friends, family with Anthem Church. For those of you who don't know a bit of our story with Restored, um, about nine years ago, Andy Rogers did a residency here with Anthem um, and then was sent out as Restored San Diego. Uh, my wife, Sarah, and I, we moved with them to San Diego, did that for three some years, and then we moved up to the valley, San Fernando Valley, Northridge, where my wife and I are actually from, um, and we are planting, we've planted the church about five years ago, and so we have the privilege of leading that community, and so Anthem is kind of like a big brother, big sister uh, to us, and so it's a privilege of just being here uh, and, and really being invited in, especially to invited in to talk about your values. You know, it's just, it's just really fun. It's like, I've been debating this week, like, should I talk about like, hey, these are your values? Um, but, but ultimately, there are values as well. Uh, Restored Church, we share identi nearly identical values with you guys. So even as we talk today about community, um, that's one of our values. This is not something like, oh, that was a good idea. We should have added that to our website. Um, this is something that we all see in Scripture as such a beautiful and necessary reality to the family of God. To, to the church. And so um, I have the privilege of preaching on community today. Uh, and what I want to do for, for a little bit is just talk about what is community and then why we need it. Uh, community can be a buzzword. It can be something that we all like, yay, community, community, uh, until you taste it. And you're like, maybe not. Um, like I was, I was fine alone for a little while. Um, and, and so today I want to give us a, a biblical picture of what community looks like so that we don't define it on our own terms uh, and then explain just why it's so important and how we can grow more in this and, and, and grow ultimately closer to Jesus. Um, there's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. Uh, we're, we're currently preaching through Romans right now in, in our church. And at the end of Romans, Paul lists some 30 people's names. 30 people in one letter that he's just like, oh, my friend Tertius and my friend Phoebe and Prisca and Aquila. Like, like Paul did relationships well, and so did Jesus. Jesus showed us that, that you can't do life alone. I think sometimes we think about Jesus like, oh, he had to just get these ragtag crew of 12 with him, and he really enjoyed time alone more, but he had to put up with these guys. Uh, Jesus was modeling for us what the life of Christ looks like, and it's done in community. And so today, if you've got your Bible, we're gonna jump into Romans 12. We're gonna read it real quick, and then we'll be kind of jumping around a little bit. But Romans 12 gives us a, a, a beautiful picture, a compelling picture of what community can look like, what community should look like. This wind, we'll see what happens. All right, Romans 12. <clears throat> I'm just gonna read through it. And, I, and as I read through Romans 12, 9 to 21, I just want you to sit, I want you to listen, get your Bibles, look into it, and think about this being the community that Jesus desires of his church. If your Bible is similar to mine, it says marks of a true Christian but you'll very quickly see it should say at marks of a true Christian community because you can't do any of these things alone. And so Romans chapter 12, verse nine says this. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, 
but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So Romans 12 is is a beautiful picture of what community can look like, what community should look like amongst brothers and sisters in the family of God. That's what the church is. This, we're under a tent, some people live streaming, people all over the place, Anthem Church. The church is God's family. If you are a Christian, you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're brothers and sisters with one another, whether or not you recognize each other. Some of you have done life very deeply for a decade. Others of you are brand new. And yet the fact is that if you've put your faith in Jesus, you've been adopted by a loving father who calls you his. You're his son, you're his daughter, and that means everybody else who calls themselves a Christian is a son and a daughter of God as well. And, and, and God doesn't have favorites. It's easy for us to think he does, right? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're the, we're the good kids. There's the shady ones over there, but we're the good kids. And God goes, no, you're all mine. I love all of you. And this is what healthy community looks like. It's what we strive for as a community, as a value of Anthem Church. Romans 12 is something we're pursuing. And so even as I read it, I would encourage you to to look back through it this week and go, okay, what parts of my life, what parts of my community group, my, my friendship with brothers and sisters, are we doing well out of Romans 12? And what seems absolutely foreign to us? Like weeping with those who weep, rejoicing with those who rejoice. I think our flesh, apart from the spirit of God, we're really good at rejoicing with those who weep and weeping with those who rejoice. Not, not to them, behind their back, of course. But, but, but when that guy, the brother or sister, gets the promotion and you don't, and they're rejoicing, weeping's a little easier. When somebody else is weeping about something that they've gone through difficult and you start thinking, well, at least, I mean, my life's not great, but at least it's not that bad. And you kind of start feeling better about yourself. These are marks and constant reminders of what Jesus' heart is, that he weeps with those who weep and he rejoices with those who rejoice. So let me unpack a few things about community of why it's so essential for us not just to show up on Sunday morning for an hour and a half, but to have deep, intimate relationships with brothers and sisters in the church family, especially brothers and sisters that we might not agree with on everything. Because the world can do that. But the church should be the family of God where there are brothers and sisters from all over the map. And we come under this tent, we gather in the cars, we show up online under the banner of Jesus Christ alone and nothing else. That's what should be the marker of the church, Christ. And so why is community so, so essential for us as Christians? Well, the first thing is this. Community is where our sin is often exposed revealing our ongoing need for Jesus. Community is is where our sin is often exposed, which shows us over and over that we actually need Jesus. The one we say we need, we see it very clearly in community. I I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty amazing when I'm by myself. Like I am humble, I am patient, I am kind, forgiving, I'm I'm just a great guy. And then suddenly someone walks into the room and things change. I become a little judgmental, become a little impatient, kind of bothered. And it can't be me, because I was doing great before they showed up. So it it has to be them, right? This is why marriage is often very difficult at the beginning. My wife and I, we've been married 10 years. And that first year was, it was gnarly. And we dated for a year and a half and we had like one little argument and it ended with like, you're so cute. (laughs) That's not how our arguments go anymore in marriage. We got married and whatever walls we had projected, whatever walls we had up, even things we didn't know, it wasn't even like we were intentionally trying to fool each other. Those walls came down and it was like, all right, 
This is, this is what it's going to be like for the next 60 years. All right. Like, I'm going to get comfortable. And that first year of marriage is hard and ongoing if you don't deal with stuff quickly. It, it could be 60 years of a hard marriage. Because what I believed, I'm so embarrassed to say this, but in my premarital counseling 10 years ago, I looked at my buddy who was doing our counseling, and I said, I feel like, don't judge me, please don't. I said, I feel like I've kind of hit like a ceiling of sanctification right now. And, and the marriage is gonna kind of like open up the ceiling to let me walk into a new season of intimacy and obedience to Jesus. And he was just like, you're in for some trouble. Because the true me was exposed in marriage. I, I used to be really awesome by myself. And now my wife is acting as a mirror. She's not creating problems in me. She's revealing problems in me. And you don't have to get married for this. You just have to have close friendships, which is the church. The church should be the place where this takes place. Unfortunately, it's usually only done in marriage, and we don't do friendships well enough in the church that everyone's just always smiling and happy. And that's not how it's supposed to be. The church can be a place where the true us shows up, where your sin is revealed, the ugliness of you is out there, and you see it, and you don't run away, you run to Jesus, the Savior, the King, who calls you in your ugliness, in your brokenness, and says, come to me. When you see your sin, he said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. We get exposed for being a sinner, and we're like, uh-oh, where do I go? He's like, me. That's the whole point. It's to me. And yet the church, we act as if we have to pretend everything's good, and yet it's community that reveals to us our ongoing sin so that we could see our ongoing need for Jesus. Hebrews 3 shows us this quite beautifully. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. It says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Who's he talking to? Brothers and sisters. Take care, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Why do you need community? Because sin is deceiving. Because sin is blinding. And when you're alone, you can start to believe your own press that you're impressive. And community begins to reveal to you that you're not all that awesome. Community begins to reveal just in their presence and hopefully you have brothers and sisters who love you so much that pull you aside and go, hey, I see something that you might not be seeing. See, if the appearance of godliness is what we're after, community's awful. But if godliness is what we're actually after, community is a beautiful gift. We, we love community until we are showed our ugliness. When we're shown some of our blindness. Paul Tripp speaks about this brilliantly um, in his book, Parenting. Even if you're not a parent, I recommend this book as a discipleship. Ultimately, parenting is just discipleship. And if you're a Christian, you're called to make disciples. And this book is just a beautiful guide to discipling. And this is what Paul Tripp says about sin and its blindness. He says, spiritual blindness is unlike physical blindness in one very significant way. When you're physically blind, you know you are blind and you immediately do things to compensate for this significant physical deficiency. Sin renders us blind too. Sin makes us all too assured and self-reliant too. Sin causes us to see ourselves as okay when we're not okay. Sin causes us to resist correction and to be offended and defensive when we are confronted. Sin makes us activate our inner lawyers and rush to our defense when it would be better for us to listen, consider, and be willing to confess. So when we have brothers and sisters who confront us, because they see specific areas of our life that we don't see, we shouldn't be shocked. Unless you're perfect, then you should be shocked. 
But we're quick to be like, oh, I'm a sinner, I need grace. And then someone's like, hey, I see some sin in you. You're like, are you, what are you talking about? My wife and I, we got two little ones. I guess they're getting bigger. My, my boy Micah, he turned eight last week, and Emma is six and a half. And about a year and some change ago, a gal from our church family moved in with us. Uh, she needed a room, and we had a room, and so she's been living with us. She got stuck with us for quarantine. Poor girl. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a challenge to, to live with the Sarians during quarantine. It's, it's just, some days are crazy. Our kids on Zoom all day long. Uh, she's 23, single gal, and she's been phenomenal, just a gift to us in this season. We've been able to continue to do date nights and go out and not just have to be stuck at home because she can hang with the kids and all that stuff. But about six months ago, we were just kind of doing our normal evening routine where we just sit down and we read, um, that we just like to do that. And so my wife reads, I read, she reads, we're all in the living room. And, and, and our friend Nadia, she says, hey, can I, um, can I talk to you guys real quick? And we're like, yeah, sure, what's up? She said, hey, um, I love you guys a ton. And then you know you're in trouble when that happens. <laughs> I love you guys a ton. Um, but I, I think I've noticed something in your parenting that, that I'd love to address. It's like, I, I took out my notebook. I said, yeah, please, tell me. <laughs> no. <laughs> Activated inner lawyer. Okay, go on, single gal who doesn't have kids. Tell me how to parent. Go. I didn't say it, but that was going on in my soul. And, and she says, I, I feel like with Micah that you're quick to say no the first time, but if he asks twice, you'll give him anything. <laughs> now, here's the thing. If you were to ask me, am I a perfect dad? I'd say, of course I'm not. And yet here is a gal who's living in our home. She, at that point, she had lived with us for eight months. She's never brought up anything about our parenting. The first time she mentions a single thing about my imperfect parenting, I'm like, there's the door. <laughs> right? My soul did that. I sat there, I listened, because I teach on this all the time. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm smart enough, and I sit there, I'm like, hmm, that's, that's an interesting observation. And I'm trying to rack my brain. I'm like, well... Okay, Jesus, help me see. Is it true? Has it ever been true? Of course that's, I mean, there's plenty of times as a parent, they're like, ask for something, you're like, no. And then they ask again, you're like, fine, just go, just go, do it. And yet my soul, I, I, I'm angry about her pointing out a deficiency in my parenting when I should be rejoicing. When I should be going, Nadia, thank you for loving us so much. I can't imagine how scary that is. Confronting your pastor, your friend, your roommate, on him not being a great dad, a perfect dad, a perfect mom, that w that's gotta be terrifying. And yet you stepped out in faith, she had spent time in prayer, she shared it with us, and we're able to go, okay, we wanna be more intentional about that. We wanna see that more often. That's what community should be able to do. And many of us, we love the idea of community until someone tells you your parenting isn't awesome. We're like, I'll be fine living alone for the rest of my life. And yet community is a gift because it shows us we need Jesus. Community is also essential because it's in community that we see whether or not we're truly mature based on love. Many of us have a difficult time wrapping our heads around what true maturity in Christ looks like when Jesus was very clear about it. In, in Matthew 22, let me read this for us. If you've been walking with Jesus any time, I hope it's somewhat memorized. Oftentimes called the great commandment. Matthew 22, verse 34. Matthew 22, verse 34. <clears throat> But when the Pharisees heard that he, Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, excuse me, asked him a question to test him. So someone who's an expert in the law is going to test Jesus. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? What is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God 
with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And he doesn't pause. He continues. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. To Jesus, the mark of maturity as a Christ follower is love. It's love of God and it's love of people. You can't do that by yourself. We often in the church define maturity based on Bible knowledge, how many years you've been attending church services, maybe how many missions trips you've been on, and maybe how good you are at spiritual disciplines. That's general. Like if someone's doing those four things well, we're like, you win. And yet Jesus says, you want to know what true maturity is in the kingdom. It's love for God. And if that's confusing, because the Pharisees were good about talking about their love for God, he said, let me boil it down for you. Love people. You can talk all day long about how much you love God, but if you hate your brother, you're in darkness, John says in 1 John. You need community to figure out where you're at with your relationship with Jesus. Community is essential. It's an essential marker into helping you see, am I mature or not? You sitting in an office all day long studying theology, which I enjoy doing, isn't the ultimate marker of maturity. It's love. And it's not just love of people that think like you, look like you, talk like you. It's loving brothers and sisters who are even very different from you. I mean, 2020 has been tough. There have been a lot of reasons to be divided, a lot of reasons to choose sides, to split churches. We have done our best, and it has been hard and far from perfect to keep a community centered around Jesus when many want to be centered around Biden or Trump. And it would be easier to just pick and choose, right? It was a couple years ago in my gospel community, one guy showed up with a Make America Great Again hat and another guy showed up with a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. I was like, well, I'm just gonna get some popcorn and just watch. <laughs> like this is, this is gonna, this will be fun. And yet we're called to love each other even if we disagree on secondary issues. We are called to pledge our allegiance first and foremost to King Jesus. And then we can talk and disagree about secondary things. But ultimately, we're called to love. And don't measure your maturity on how well you love people who think the exact same way as you. How do you love those who think very different from you, yet love Jesus? Are you able to have conversations of grace? Are you able to listen without defending yourself quickly? Are we able to do this as a community? Because if we're not, we are far, far more immature than we could imagine. And yet this is the marker that Jesus gives us. Dallas Willard said, if you want to know the true mark of a true Christian, a mature Christian, it's this. When they're wronged, their instant reaction is love. <laughs> I could chew on that for another 50 years. Like, when I'm wronged, my immediate reaction is wrong the other person. When I'm operating out of the flesh, that's what happens. And yet, when we're walking by the Spirit, when we're growing in Christ, we're wronged, and we do not overcome evil with evil, but with good. How can we do that? Well, we look to Christ. All we did was wrong him, and what was his reaction to us? Love. Love. Not just a cute love where he said, okay, we'll just disagree on some stuff. I'll stay over here, you stay over there. But a love that went to the cross to pay for your sins. It's a sacrificial love. It's a joyful love. It's a love that Jesus has now given us through his spirit that we can pour out on others in our church family, in our community. This is what he is inviting us into. It was about seven years ago that my buddy Andy, he was the lead pastor restored San Diego. I was the associate pastor. And we were on a staff retreat. And Andy is, is if you know him, um, he really is, he's a special dude. 
Uh, he ha has taught me how to love. I, I grew up thinking that maturity was knowledge. I really, Bible knowledge, just memorize, know, just because in the church, generally, the more Bible you know, people are like, wow, that guy's awesome. Just, it's just, it's just a natural reaction. Andy was one of the first people who saw through my Bible knowledge and called me out on my lack of love. It was seven years ago, we were on a staff retreat, and I, we, he and I, we, we have, I'm just an aggressive type of person, hopefully in love and grace and truth, but I, I, we just like to talk. And so Andy and I, we would, we'd go at it. And we went at it uh, at the staff retreat over something that we disagreed with. And I won the argument. Like, so, it was just clear. I won the argument. I won. He, like, conceded. It was great. It felt awesome. And he's like, hey, can I talk to you? Because it was in front of our staff team. He said, hey, can I talk to you? And so we go to another room. And, and he says, hey, man, I, I love you. And you're like, uh-oh, here it comes. And he said, you're, you're sharp. You're a sharp guy. You know a lot of Bible." But what scares me about you is that I don't know if anyone would describe you as a person who loves. <sighs> now, if you're a Christian and you hear that, you should probably start doubting your salvation. <laughs> right? I mean, like, if this is the marker of what it is to be a Christian. And he just said something. And here's the thing. I was silenced because he was 100% right. See, I, I didn't grow up being taught how to love. I grew up being taught to be nice. And, and it's possible to be very nice and hate and murder people in your heart. But to love takes the spirit of Christ who teaches you to see through difficulty, teaches you to see through ugliness and sin and continue to pursue because you see that you were the one who was lost. You were the one who was far gone and yet he pursued you in your lostness and did not give up on you. Would we be a people who are more committed to loving others than to just knowing the right things? Is that doctrine important? Absolutely. I'm not here to be like, who cares about the Bible? No, the Bible is important, but the Bible tells us love is the marker of true maturity as a Christian. So let's not skip over that. And the last thing I, I, I wanna chat through is why community is so essential is that community points us back to Christ. Jesus is the goal of the Christian life. The goal of the Christian life isn't to become nice, to become loving. The goal of the Christian life is to be with Jesus and become like him. That, that, that's what he's saved us into, into a kingdom where we get to spend time with him, become like him, and reflect his goodness to the world. And we need community to do that. This season where many of us have been distanced from one another has been very, very difficult. It has been so hard where we aren't able to necessarily be as close as we'd want, masked down, talking with each other, whatever it is. And for many of us, we've had a difficult time connecting with Jesus in the midst of this past year. I have. This year, 2020 was very difficult for me connecting with Christ. And I think early on I was like, uh oh, what's going on? This is weird. And so I started chewing on the reality that the bride, the church, is Christ's body. And, and the bride, Christ's body, wasn't operating the way that I believe it should or could because of COVID. And so for me to be lacking an in intimacy with Jesus because I'm not connecting with the church isn't something weird. It actually makes sense. Yeah, there, there should be a lack of intimacy and a, and a lack of connection with Christ when we don't have his body. The church is essential for us to connect with him. We need one another to point us back to him. We talk a lot about preaching the gospel to ourselves. It's a very important discipline for you to be able to preach the promises of Jesus to yourself depending on whatever season of life or day you're going through. But there is something more powerful than preaching the gospel to yourself. It's when a brother or sister preaches the gospel to you. Like to your specific, I'm not even talking about this. Because I, I, I love preaching Man, I, I've been so disappointed over the years of preaching where I preach an entire sermon. I get a coffee with someone the next day. They ask me a question. I'm like, oh, I talked about that yesterday, but let me reiterate it. And then they start weeping. They're like, I've never heard that before. Like, I said it yesterday. 
but it was applied to them right then and there. And we need each other to be able to do that. We need one another in each other's lives to point each other back to Christ. One of the most shocking verses, I think, in the New Testament is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. The Apostle Paul, it's one of his last letters he's writing, probably the last before he dies. He's writing it to his son in the faith, faith Timothy. And in chapter 2, Paul says to Timothy, remember Jesus Christ. Remember, think about this. Paul's discipled Timothy for a decade or two. And he's, his last letter to Timothy, he's like, hey, I, I, I've got some important stuff to tell you. Don't forget about Jesus. Why? Because we forget about Jesus. Because we can go a day without thinking about Christ. Because we can go an hour without thinking about Christ. We need brothers and sisters who know us, who love us, who care about us, and can encourage us and challenge us. Personally, where we're at in that moment, not a future version of us, but where we are. Maybe when you begin drifting into an unhealthy relationship, you need a brother or sister to come alongside you and say, hey, I love you, but I'm worried for you. I'm not standing here in judgmentalism, but I see the potential of where this is taking you, and I love you too much. Remember Jesus, he loves you, he's for you. You don't need that. It's gonna take you away from him. I love you. For a brother or sister who's caught up in a cycle of sin and feels as if God's grace is for everyone else, you need to be able to look at that brother or sister or have someone speak to you look you in the eyes and remind you of the truth in Hebrew that God has chosen to forget our sins. He has wiped them away through the cross of Jesus Christ and he's not giving up on you. He loves you. He doesn't love a future version of you. He loves you right now. We need those reminders. We need those reminders when we're going through suffering and it, the sky is just dark and we feel like we might not be able to get through another day. We need brothers and sisters to come alongside us and go, I don't understand this. I don't. I don't get it at all, but he loves you, he's with you, and he's for you, and he's proven it through the cross. One of my favorite stories that's taken place in our church over the last few years, there's a gal who's gone through immense physical suffering, young gal. And she called me and my buddy Stephen, who's one of the other pastor elders in the church, and she said, will you come and pray for me? I've just given up on, on, on God healing me, but I just, I, I want one more chance. Just would you guys come pray for me? So you can barely get out of bed most days. And so we come over to the apartment. Her husband lets us in and we, we, we go there and he says, she, she's, she's struggling, she's in bed. Can you guys just go pray for her? And so we all walk in to the room. And she's laying there in bed. She said, will you just pray for me? I'm like, yep, we'll pray for you. We pray for her, we pray for healing. For whatever reason, it doesn't seem like God heals her. Afterwards, we're talking and she just touches the side of the bed and she says, you know who comes over every Tuesday? Jamie comes over every Tuesday and she lays here next to me for a couple of hours. Jamie's a member in our church. She's on our staff and she lays there and she just listens and prays for her. She sits there in the darkness of where this girl can barely get out of bed and a sister in Christ goes and meets her exactly where she's at and just prays and listens. She's like, this is what's getting me through. This is what the family of God gets to do. We get to rally around one another, whether we're in a season of strength or a season of weakness, and go, I need you, and you need me. And we together lift one another's eyes back to Christ Jesus, crucified and risen in our place, and we don't run. 
We don't run when our sin's exposed. We don't run when suffering is too intense. We had a couple whose sin was exposed a couple of years ago. Like some, some ugly stuff, stuff that if your goal is to be a nice person, this is, the, this is it. You just run. And I was mediating a conflict between the gospel community leaders and the couple, and it got ugly, ugly. I thought it was gonna be a short meeting, so we decided to stand for the meeting. We should have sat and eaten like three meals. It was a long, long meeting. They're accusing each other. It's ugly. And at one point, Spirit of God breaks in and causes deep repentance over the couple. They start apologizing, repenting about the things they were believing, the things they were doing. And then he starts crying, saying, but we loved this church. But we loved this church. And I was standing there, I was like, what do, you, what do you mean you loved the church? He said, well, well, now we have to go somewhere else because no one's gonna accept us now. I was like, dude, this is like the only requirement to be in the church, it's repentance. Like, no, you're not going anywhere. We won't let you go anywhere. Like, like you have to stay. The, the goal of the church is to be a community where repentant, broken men and women come in and go, I'm a mess and I need Jesus. He's doing that and he thinks he needs to run. We're like, no, you can now be a leader, yay. Like this is literally it. Don't run. Some of us are terrified of being exposed. You have secrets that you think that if this was exposed, I'd have to run. Friends, stop believing the lie of Satan. Bring it into the light. The sin loses its power. Satan loses his grip when you bring the ugliness, the secrets and the sin into the light. And we get to cry together going, he loves me and I can stay because I'm repentant and I'm broken, but I'm known and I'm loved by a community and more importantly, by the king of all kings. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness that leads us to repentance. We thank you for the cross that has shown us that, that when we were the ugliest, when we were at our ugliest sin, when we were your enemies, Christ, you died for us. And if you would die for us then, certainly you love us now. Would we care more about what you think than what others think about us? God, would I, I just beg you right now, I beg you right now that, that as Satan begins to whisper, no, 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 you can't share that. As he tightens his grip of darkness around some souls, I pray, Spirit of God, that you would break them free, that today would be a day of freedom where they can confess their sins to a brother or sister and find grace and freedom and forgiveness in you, Christ. That today would be the end of secrets. Today would be the beginning of intimacy with you and with the church family, Jesus. You've proven you love us at our worst. We've got nothing to fear. We've got nothing to be ashamed of. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Would your church be a light in this community? Would this be a community that the city of Thousand Oaks looks to and goes, it is safe to be there. It's safe to be there as a person who's honest about their brokenness because they point us back to the truth and love of Jesus Christ. We love you. We trust you. It's in your beautiful name, King Jesus. Amen.